That was very insensitive of you, Kareem. Wait, the intro's not working. Why is the intro working? Don't worry about it. Uh, wait, I got all right. I got this. That's, that's gonna make it more difficult for him to edit. Just be quiet. And welcome to the Crypto Basic Podcast. My name is Michael Lockie. This is the Friday flagship. This will be released on August the 8th of 2018. This is episode number, which number are we for this? I believe it's 98. This is going to be 98. Okay, so the following Wednesday after this is released will be episode 100. We are considering something a little unique for that. We haven't decided fully what that's going to be yet, so please keep on the lookout for that. Let's go ahead and introduce my co-host today, Brent Philbin. Whoa, well, whoa, well, it's me. And Kareem Baruke. Hello, everybody. Let's go ahead and uh, get the announcement started off with a, another predicted victory from Team Kareem. Uh, Brent, how do you feel about this? I This isn't even like... Whatever, if, of course, like we can't. He has double the bankroll of either one of us at this point. We can't catch him. We're just battling for who has to do the stupid stuff. All right, you know what? I'm gonna. How's take- that? How's that working out? <laughs> so uh, here's the opportunity. Me. Here's the opportunity. What is the lesson from this contest? That if you think you're smarter than the market, you're wrong. If you want to crush it in this space, just go buy some of those big, juicy, awesome projects get yourself some bitcoin get yourself some neo get yourself some dash get yourself some ethereum the cheapest and hottest and by that i mean not the cheapest but definitely the hottest <laughs> um anyway so your cheap hot coin is cardano yeah exactly um anyway so uh yeah it's another month another uh, embarrassing defeat for mike and brent i don't even want to give myself credit for that victory uh it's more like you guys are losing terribly <laughs> However, more importantly, uh, we have a winner. That means that one of the members of Team Kareem, that is one of the listeners that had the foresight to pick my portfolio for this contest, has won, and their name is Sarutobi Sasuke. So, Sarutobi Sasuke, you are the winner for the month of July. You know what that means, that you can choose between getting some Crypto Basic swag. You just have to give us your address and tell us what you want, maybe a sweater or a shirt. You can also decide to... Pick the next topic of our 101, such as um, we've had some really interesting ones. So you could pick a coin or a concept or something like that. And we also had another uh, format. You guys remember, we haven't really talked about this in a while, but we had the idea that you could also pick to write down 10 questions, uh, surprise questions. Damn, it's 10 now? What, wasn't it like what? It was three, but it we can make it 10. Three each, but yeah, it, no, it kind of no, no, wasn't that appealing. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no. That one wasn't appealing. Remember, I, I presented you guys the idea. You said you liked it where they can do like five or ten questions or whatever, like a rapid fire to one person in the group. And they but can blind, even, right? Right. Like the person who's going to be answering the questions, whether it's Brent or Mike or myself, we don't know what questions are going to be asked. And then we just fire it up and ask the questions. So you would give the questions to one of us. We won't share it with the other ones. And then maybe on our next flagship or whatever, we're going to be like, oh, OK, Brent. These are the questions that Sarah Toby Sasuke wants to ask, or Mike, or whatever. So anyway, those are your options. Congratulations, Sarah Toby Sasuke, for picking Team Kareem. Uh, let's get on with the flagship, guys. I don't know, like, how many flagships are we going to start off by saying that Team Kareem won again, and that you guys are uh, Approximately terrible. one out of four. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, there, there's going to be one, exactly one more, and I will go ahead and predict that Team Kareem will win <clears throat> the overall contest. Uh, so when you do, I will also be right because of my prediction. It was a really good thing that you guys didn't take my advice and actually put a thousand dollars in these portfolios specifically, so that we could watch them grow over the next <laughs> six months. It's a really good yep. idea that we decided not to do that. Yep, yep. I'm very glad that that thousand dollars is not three hundred now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to the current events section here. And uh, we're going to start off with the Winklevoss twins. It appears their um, the EFT has been rejected. However, the SEC commissioner offered an explanation as to why. Brent, what did you find here? 
th- so the the ETF was rejected for the Winklevoss twins. Not to be confused with that ETF we talked about last week, that or maybe two weeks ago. That's taking comments from the public. That's a different one, and they do expect to get approved, especially with the public comments being pub being positive. But uh, Hester Pierce is the SEC commissioner that offered a dissenting opinion. She was not happy with the fact that this was uh, declined. She thinks it's stifling innovation. Uh, you can we can link. We'll link to that whole dissenting opinion. One fun fact, though, is that the crypto community decided they were going to show her some love. She had 1,300 Twitter followers and now has 16,000. Yeah, so, and just to clarify, it's one of five commissioners, right? So this is a regulatory body (coughs) that has five individuals in it that would normally vote on a decision like this. So her explanation for what ended up happening was... The original application of the Winklevoss twins was reviewed by staff members, not at the commissioner level. And it was a staff level decision to reject it. So then that was back from, I believe, 2016 or 2017. So they recently reviewed that and the commissioners voted three to one. There was one member missing, so only four people voted. Three people voted to maintain that rejection of the ETF, and she was the only one that voted against it. That's why she wrote a dissenting opinion. So she's one of a body of five. And in her dissenting opinion, she said, uh, number one, that she wasn't pushing for crypto, that her dissent had nothing to do with being pro crypto, but specifically that she was pro technology. And one of her quotes was, from my perspective, we need to be mindful of what our role is as the SEC. And it's not to be the ones who decide which innovations and which technologies get through and which ones don't. That's a very dangerous position to put ourselves in, and I think it really does harm investors because it denies them opportunity. And then as far as that whole Twitter thing, she was even quoted like being surprised, and she's like, they're going to be pretty bored. All those crypto people that followed me on Twitter are going to be pretty bored with my twi- tweets because they have nothing to do with crypto, and they're all boring regulatory <coughs> stuff. Um, but anyway, she's now working from the inside to basically – try to push the sec in a different direction so what i'm getting out of this is that we have a new person to target on manage flitter so we can get some of them follows back from her to somewhere they want to be such as at crypto basic pod you know what i'm saying yep follow us on twitter uh real quick before we move on uh mike your mic is i is super scratchy are you on the yeti or are you on your tap tap on the yeti Nope, you're using this. Sorry, YouTube. Technical difficulties. Stand by. Um, Mike, soon sound better. Should I stop my recording, or what should I do here? No, no, don't stop recording. Recording's fine. It's great in. Yeah, yeah. But oh, it's on up here. Your audacity should be on your Yeti. You need to change your uh, other. I can't change. The, it's grayed out because it's recording. I can't change the, the input. Don't output. change the audacity. Don't change audacity. Change the appear in. The website. Oh, I, okay, I asked. I asked if it was appearing, and I didn't hear a response. Okay. Crap. Uh, where is this at? Okay, mic. Microphone Yeti. Yeah, I'm using the Yeti. Uh, <clears throat> it says wait. that I am. All right, then on to the next news story. Okay, I guess there's nothing we can do. You're, when you tapped on it, we heard nothing, right? Tap again. Yeah, you're not using that mic. I don't know why it's. Well, if if the Yeti's selected and it's just not playing it, I don't know what to do. I, you could actually reload the screen, reload the screen, and then select the Yeti again. Yeah, like you. Can that might work. Your, yeah. <laughs> Dab it. Microphone is. There we it's go. A little different. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, that's much better. Um, all right, guys. So if your mic sounds bad, refresh the screen. <laughs> you guys wonder why I can't figure out any of this fucking technology stuff. 
<laughs> All right, turn Brent, it off since, and on again. Hey, Brett, since your bullshit detector is doing so well, uh, what's going on with this new coin called Apollo? Uh, <laughs> I So I saw this on Reddit, and I just thought it was hilarious. Apollo is a new scam coin that's out there, and uh, there was somebody on Reddit that kind of like figured it out why it was a scam. Um, the funny part is this: the guy who's running the Apollo coin has scammed before. He scammed Kickstarter. He scammed Kickstarter for 30k to lead an expedition to to Congo in search of dinosaurs that are still alive. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I have many questions. <laughs> uh, the first one is we have we have alligators in Florida. You could have just came here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're pretty much dinosaurs. They're like very scaly and and, and scary. Um, and they go with you on bee runs. <laughs> the so yeah, he could have uh, he could have definitely gone anywhere because there's no uh, there's no dinosaurs in existence. He was. At the time, an expert on paleontology and zoology. I don't know what is going on with Kareem. He went and grabbed a book, and he's looking through it. No, I'm guessing it's going to be something quality to add. What, what's the problem? No, 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 no. You, you said living dinosaurs, and it made me think about like this like super ancient uh, creature that was found basically alive that we thought was extinct for hundreds <clears> of years, but I can't remember the name. So, but no, continue, please. I wasn't even gonna. Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> if it was found by the guy who <laughs> did no, Apollo coin, it was not found coin, by I'll... that guy. I'm almost 100 sure this was. It would found. be very much like Brent to actually like this guy might be the most like uh, the famous living dinosaur researcher in the world, and Brent's like, nope, he's a scam. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't think I don't think no, this, no, this, this is... was found I'm by a Kickstarter. <laughs> anyway, he is now all of a sudden a crypto expert. There's a lot more to why it's a scam on the Reddit post. We'll put it in the show notes, but <clears throat> it's just important to to mention. Do uh, your the, research. Is there a, an obvious thing that that they found that should be sent out as an alert for others to maybe learn from or oh, to yeah. learn what yeah. type of scam it is? So check it out. Tiktaalik no. was the name, by the way. I knew. I knew it was. You see this thing? This dinosaur, like this is an old fossil, like millions of years old. We thought it was extinct. And then found this little guy. Turns out they're still around. See? Maybe this oh. cack started so this was wasn't, Maybe this wasn't a scam at all. Maybe this guy found a fish. Yeah, he was looking okay. for Tiktaalik. <laughs> yep. Is that a National Geographic? Uh, no. He he went from... Richard Dawkins, the greatest show on Earth. I recommend it. One the God definition? He went from Tiktaalik to Vitalik. All right. <laughs> TikTok oh, Brent. Wow. You should have been a rapper. That was pretty yeah. good. Hey, so speaking of Vitalik, uh, he actually has spoken on Twitter, and it looked like he wasn't shitting on anybody this time. What did he say? Yeah, well, first of all, we need to go back to the other thing. You skipped over the other scam I have. Oh, <laughs> Brent, I'm sorry. I don't know if you know how transitions work. I thought we had a wide open window, and I don't think it mattered what order we talk about Vitalik and McAfee. I wanted to talk about oh, my scams back are. to back. Okay, then by all means. So literally my introduction for this was going to be, I feel like McAfee has literally installed his antivirus software on this show because we can't go a single Friday without talking about this freak show. So please, by all <laughs> means, Brad, what other scams we got? So he's shilling this new wallet that is unhackable. It's unhackable, very similar to the Titanic being unsinkable, right? And <laughs> a little foreshadowing where this is going. It's called Bit Bitfee Wallet, right? He offered a hundred thousand dollar bounty to anybody that could hack it because it's unhackable. Uh, it's been hacked, so <laughs> let me all just spoil you on that. Um, there's a group that uh, uh, called Oversoft NL that has gained root access to this wallet, and they also there was another long post I didn't understand that was about the security being shit. So. Uh, this wallet is really bad. Don't buy it. Um, they said, on top of everything else, they said we're open source. We're a great community project. They are not open source. They have not released their code, but they're saying they're open source because apparently they like explained how they were going to do the code in like a PDF, but didn't release the code on like a GitHub or anything. So 
yeah, they swore that they were uh, that yeah they were open source and they weren't. And as a rule, if John McAfee is pushing something, just don't do it. He's batshit crazy. It is entertaining to watch him be batshit crazy, and I understand why people like to watch him go down his rabbit holes and go crazy. But he's insane. Don't do anything that the guy says. Like he, McAfee is literally the worst thing on earth. If it's on your computer, it's basically its own virus. So, you know, looking at something like this, obviously there's a lot of people out there that would argue, oh, how can you say that? McAfee's extremely successful. Look what he's accomplished. Da, da, da. But all I keep thinking about when I see this story is that if I was going to take a gamble on a McAfee product, which I'm not, and I won't, but if for some reason, like let's say this guy had a cryptocurrency that had some utility other than talking to him, right? <laughs> like let's just say that <laughs> he made a cryptocurrency that actually had some other utility. I can see the perspective that his high variance personality might have a positive expectation overall. But I would never take that gamble on a wallet. You know what I'm saying? Maybe on a crypto project that can grow, but never on a wallet. I'm sorry. When I'm thinking about where I'm going to store my crypto assets, I'm not that interested in high variance plays and crazy, <laughs> uh, you know, advertising and stuff like that. I just want some secure, safe, low key uh, products. So I'm going to stick with my ledger and I'm not going to switch to this. Yeah, no, nope. I would I would very much not recommend switching to this thing uh, or anything McAfee suggests. Don't do it. It's fascinating because there's very few people that have been put into the public spotlight that truly believe their bullshit as much as this guy believes his own. It's un like, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to it's hard to not like the guy. He like he is so adamant. He's so like, I don't know. It's, I've just. He's he's crazy. He, it's a personality yeah, thing. I find fun. it pretty easy not to like him. So maybe we're All just right. attracted to different personality traits. It, no, he it falls into the guilty pleasure category. Like <laughs> I'm not proud that I like it, but I just have to keep watching. It's like a train wreck. I, I feel like he's kind of like a tr like a Donald Trump. If Donald Trump wasn't the fucking president, it would be entertaining to watch him go off on himself on Twitter. But like he. He is, unfortunately. So. Did you ever see the Trevor Noah? This is like from before that just shows clips of him, and they just uh, he's like, "Oh, we're, we've been missing it the whole point. He's just an old grumpy guy." And then it just shows yeah. clips of like Donald Trump ranting about the most random stuff on Twitter, and you're like, "Oh my god, he is just an old grumpy guy." <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh. So speaking of Twitter here, let's get back to Vitalik, Brent. Uh, what did this tweet say, and how did you feel about it? Well, it was it was, when Vitalik talks, people listen. So I thought it was important to read this tweet on air. He said, "I think there's too much emphasis on Bitcoin, Ethereum, slash whatever ETFs, and not enough emphasis on making it easier for people to buy five dollars to a hundred dollars in cryptocurrency via cards at corner stores. The former is better for pumping price, but the latter is much better for actual adoption." And he's right. Like we do get excited about the fact that these ETFs may be coming in and driving the price upward. But if we're actually wanting crypto to be adopted by people, it needs to be very easy for them to have it. It needs to be very easy for somebody to use it. So he makes a very valid point. Um, I recently put something in our private Discord that we have for the for the staff, a a link for something that I wanted to look into in the future, which was basically a micro investing platform for crypto. And what I liked about it was that, and I, and I didn't dig into the details. That's why I'm not even going to release the name because I don't want to, you know, mislead something before we've done our research. But I thought it was particularly interesting because, you know, with your banks and whatnot, it, I've had a couple different banks that offer this, but they offer micro investing where you can round up your transactions. You could add, you know, if, if your transaction is three dollars and forty five cents, you can take fifty five cents and put it into a savings account. Well, this other company that I was looking at, they will do that with your crypto. And every time the change adds up to ten dollars, it would deposit the ten dollars onto this site and you could micro invest into. And what I really liked about this project was it only had things that we really liked as investing options, such as Zencash and Neblio and a couple of other small options that we 
have really liked in our research. So hopefully we can do a little more research on that as far as actual micro investing goes. Um, but otherwise, what I like about this is that Vitalik is trying to keep perspective pretty wide and understand that, you know, this is pretty much a battle of the little man against the big man. And I think that keeping that perspective is pretty important sometimes. Yeah, on a on a practical basis, I do yeah. I think that this does show some of the weaknesses of cryptocurrency from the perspective of like like I think he makes a great point, right? Like you should be able to buy a twenty dollar Ethereum gift card, for example, and just give it to somebody. But think about how complicated that would be if you put twenty dollars worth of Ethereum in a card and then like, how would that work? You know what I'm saying? Because if it goes <clears> up in value, then whoever's selling that card would just make sense to liquidate it immediately and trade it for Ethereum. So, or would it have to be where, like, it it would have to be an empty card and just do $20 worth of Ethereum at that moment. So, like, some, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, the, the options would be you could do the current value of Ethereum or you could, you could have some type of, of stable Ethereum coin where you could buy 20... Uh, ETH dollars, and then whenever you go and log in and redeem the gift card, it says, okay, this is currently worth X Ethereum. Is that what you want? You could do it that way. I don't know. It's it's still a long ways to go, and Not I remember... Easy to pull off, yeah. And yeah. not to mention, anything involving gift cards and corner stores comes with a ton of fees, and that's really not the way that any of us plan on purchasing our crypto. So I, 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 didn't, I don't know. I have mixed feelings on this. Uh, what I think I don't know. He's concentrating on corner store gift cards or whatever, but I think what he means is just like that needs to be in the bag of tricks. Like that kind of thing needs to be available because it's super easy to do that with U.S. dollars and any store that you want to spend your money at. So that mm -hmm. also overarching meaning you know, he's just not using the coffee analogy because it's kind of been beaten to death. But he's you know that's part of what he's saying. I think. As somebody that has purchased a large amount of corner store gift cards for online poker purposes, I can say this isn't easy. It's not cheap. And most of the time, the employees at these places, such as, you know, in Florida, we have Walgreens at CVS. They're not very helpful. They're not really sure what you need. It's, it's kind of something you have to completely figure out on your own. And I don't know. This, this part isn't that big a deal to me. Yeah. It also, how do they? How do you stop an attack vector there from them gleaming the uh, the private keys and stuff like that? I don't know. Like, oh, scratch offs. Well, we've seen we've explained that that's been game before with the ledger when they threw in the 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 fake scratch offs into the ledger boxes so that you would ha have the the key sent to them. You know, very. Uh, anyway, whatever. I li I like when Vitalik talks. Unless I just had this interesting idea. Oh, I just had this interesting idea of like a five dollars scratch off at the corner store, and you could get like ten dollars of Ethereum, but like twenty dollars in Bitcoin. Just like depends on what you win. If you match like the logos, then yeah, if you match like three of the logos and a two X, then you get the. <laughs> this is a part of a private key that you get to go put on. That'd be sweet, and then uh, and then like if people do rebrands, then you'll know like how old the thing is. You're like, this is the old Ripple logo. What do you mean? I don't want to like do this scratch off. The XRP logo is way different. Anything else we want to touch on here? Or do we want to move on? Yeah, we move on. All righty. Uh, next up, we got CZ. And uh, I've talked to Brent briefly about this before we started recording. But he has some thoughts on Tether that we both find pretty interesting. Uh, summarize this for us, Brent. Yeah, it was, it was a quick thought. So he was doing an interview, and I don't actually know how old this was. I just stumbled on it on YouTube on one of my rabbit holes, and I was I decided to listen. And they were asking CZ about Tether, and he had been to uh, the Bitfinex headquarters, I believe. And they said, you know, have you seen? He's like, I haven't seen the money. I don't know. I haven't seen the bank accounts, but I do believe it's likely there. And he said, basically... Uh, the reason he thinks that they haven't released their uh, bank account information to an auditor is because that if they do show where their bank accounts are, that they're going to get shut down. And that is not an angle that I had considered <clears throat> when we are kind of like going off on Tether for not having the audit. 
that they may be in a jurisdiction where they are immediately shut down or attacked regular, you know, via regulatory bodies. I don't think it's enough to push this in a direction where we start to think good things about Tether, but I think it's important to consider all angles. This is one of the first times that I hear a CC story that I find wholly unconvincing. Okay, so here's, look, the amount of Tether that is in circulation means that if there was a one-to-one dollar match on any account in any jurisdiction that is going to try to shut them down, that jurisdiction has already asked that bank, like that bank has already has to ask, what is this money for? Like, what are we supposed to believe here that th- that they have like a couple of hundred million dollars in a bank somewhere and that that bank has no idea what their business model is? You can't do it could be a hundred banks. <clears throat> Okay, so, I have eight banks myself. <laughs> no, I understand that you have eight banks, and I, I'm not. I don't have a vision of Tether just having all the money in a single account. But what I'm saying is that this isn't happening in a vacuum. There's other behaviors, such as the way that yeah. they fired an auditor, the fact that they only responded at a certain point, the fact that they've made no effort to try to get an auditor that would just try to maintain their banking accounts anonymous or make a statement to the community. Look, basically, this this sounds plausible. But it doesn't seem like the best explanation for what's happening. And I feel like you can always take a situation and try to find plausible, like, okay, well, it could be this. Yeah, sure, maybe, maybe. But more than likely what's happening here is that people that were given the power to print money are printing money. You see what I'm saying? Like, if I give you the power to print money, what are you going to do with that? Think about the Mm -hmm. tremendous power that they're being given. So... I get what he's saying. I get that that's a valid angle. I don't think that that's what's happening. Yeah, I, I again, I don't think it pushes us in that direction. I just we are so negative on Tether. I think that it's important to mention some of the counter arguments that we haven't mentioned. I do not think that they are, are avoiding the audit because of this, but it was something to consider. We yeah, also- I agree. I agree with both points. So that there is a lot of plausible deniability here, and I am not going to take this as a change of heart in my own mind. It is something that I'm glad we brought to the table because I like to leave open that door that you know I am wrong or we have made a wrong assessment on this company or business or however you want to you know exactly describe them. At the end of the day, this doesn't do enough for me. It does come from a pretty reputable source, but I, I don't think that. Tether is safe in any way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've said before that CZ has a an incentive to make sure Tether FUD doesn't exist. So, a massive incentive. Not only does so, he have an incentive, he's also not even claiming to have seen the money here. Yeah. So it's it's his reputation is almost irrelevant <clears throat> because he's all it is is an intelligent person coming up with a plausible explanation. Okay. Do you guys see a scenario where any outcome of the Tether situation leads to Binance not honoring all of the Tethers on their site? Um, I don't know how that, I don't know how that would shake out. I mean, if every exchange is planning on not doing it, then they'll just not do it. They're not going to be the only ones that pay people the money. So, and it probably also depends on how Tether behaves, you know, because we don't know how the cards are going to collapse at all. Right. And one of the things yeah. that Tether did when there started being a lot of public backlash is they pulled back on the printing. I don't know if you guys remember, there was a moment there where they just went crazy with the Tether creation. There was this massive public backlash. There was the story about them firing the auditors. And what did they do? They just kind of pulled back and laid low until Tether was out of the news, until crypto markets had changed, and then they just started printing some more money again with no indication that people were necessarily buying more Tether. Um, I feel like a lot of the the printing of Tethers have been directly correlated with the pumps in Bitcoin. And when the market has gone significantly uh, more, you know, east-west, then I think that their incentives have been drastically reduced to print. So I think that it makes more sense to print a hundred million dollars and then buy a bunch of stuff with it as it's prices, you know, and, and that's going to be a huge part in the price going up as well. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if there's correlation or causation there, but the, I, we, people have noticed that the, the Bitcoin price is correlated with tether and a couple of different papers as far as going up when they print and that kind of thing. So, and they also they posited that Tether is exceptionally good at buying the dip. And 
which but if they're buying so much of it that would mean that they would force it out of a dip so i don't know uh, uh, again still do not think tether is safe avoid it if you can and this is why kareem says if you give somebody the power to print money they will print money yep i would uh brent you got a quick update on some uh nano ledger adoption Who oh yeah that? the so the ledger nano has monero on it now uh, and it's good to go. So the, they were, they're having issues integrating Monero for a long time since their blockchain is so different, and now they're good. So rather than put a link to the story of how Monero is now integrated into the Ledger Nano S, we'll put a link to our Ledger Nano S referral. We're up to $22 in referrals from that now, so we got to get to like 50 before we're allowed to take any money out, but uh, I'm just saying... Like you could go ahead and click that in the show notes and get a ledger, especially now if you're a Monero maximalist. We are rich. Yeah. Oh boy. Pretty much. <clears throat> All right. Let's take the ship to crypto around the world. Hold, please. I think this is good now. <laughs> I'm slightly disappointed in Kareem because I was going to just hold a straight face and not acknowledge the music at all. It just like <laughs> watch Fred get upset, but like, it didn't is work. This thing out. On? <laughs> is this thing on? <clears throat> all right, Kareem. Uh, crypto around the world, you're up. There's a really interesting collaboration between Australia and Germany. I'm interested to hear what you got to say about this. Yeah, specifically, it was a trade and supply chain experiment to see um, how effective blockchain would be. <coughs> so this was initiated by the CBA, which is the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. And they were able to ship 17 tons of almonds from Australia to Hamburg, Germany. Um, and specifically, they had a couple of industries or companies participate in the tracking. So you had the bank, CBA, you had a uh, Alum Orchards, which is the actual agriculture that was growing the um, almonds. <clears throat> Pacific National, which is a rail company that was transporting this to a port. The port companies themselves that and the shipping carriers that were taking it to Germany. And there was even a hardware and software company uh, from Australia called LX Group that put IoT devices inside of the shipment so that at the entire time while these almonds were being sent to germany they could view and track the location of the almonds they could see the conditions like uh, the temperature and the humidity and they used ethereum in order to do it and the article is just talking about how in the future this would probably be in a private blockchain but this was like a proof of concept basically but it's just exciting because you're starting to see you know multiple companies um, actually putting these ideas to the test. You know, will blockchain be used for supply chain? Well, according to this, yeah, IoT and blockchain combined in order to perfectly track a package as well as its conditions throughout its entire uh, supply chain. So it's kind of interesting. Very interesting. And um, in this article, did they discuss the costs or how cost effective this would be or how practical this would be? Did they touch on that at all? No, this was more of a proof of concept. And I think it was mostly I would assume that it was actually bankrolled by the Commonwealth Bank <clears throat> of, of Australia and that everybody else was a participant. But no, they didn't get into the costs. No, but listen. This is one of the very specific use cases that make a lot of sense with cryptocurrency or with not crypto, but with blockchain and establishing start to finish that something hasn't been tampered with because there's been some serious problems with something being tampered with or going, you don't know where it comes from. You know, there's, there's big movement in the United States to be like very cognizant of the fact that your thing that you're buying is free trade or fair trade or whatever. And uh, if it'd be a lot easier to track that if you could have a real, real uh, supply chain coin audit. So what you're saying is we should set up a booth outside of Trader Joe's and just try to intercept all the fair trade fans and get them on the show. 
I mean, we can just set up a booth outside of Trader Joe's for fun. Trader Joe's is delicious. Yeah, I'm a fan. Anything else on this topic, guys? No. Alrighty. All right. Next up on crypto around the world, uh, we're going to go back to Venezuela. And I find this story particularly interesting. Uh, Kareem, what radical decision are they leaning towards making? All right. So as we've talked about on the show before, Venezuela is experiencing ridiculous <laughs> inflation, like historical levels of inflation. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has now estimated that by the end of 2018, uh, Venezuela's inflation will have reached one million percent. So Jesus, that's right. This is starting to get into like the big, big time uh, hyperinflations that we saw, like uh, Zimbabwe in the early 2000s or 1920s uh, Germany, uh, you know, Weimar Republic. So anyway, one of the plans that Venezuela had was to, in June, just drop three zeros off of the currency. But they weren't prepared, actually, and the banking leaders at the time said that they weren't prepared to do that. So they postponed it until August. And now the inflation has continued to get so bad that it's not even three zeros. Now they're going to get rid of five zeros from the currency. So just to explain what that would mean, they're going to take out all of the bills out of circulation. And if you had one million Bolivares before, that would now be equal to 10 sovereign Bolivares. So one million goes down to 10. We just get rid of five zeros. Um, and of course... You know, this is all in order to try to combat the inflation. Uh, Maduro, the president, said that this new Bolivar was going to be pegged to the petrodollar. Remember that cryptocurrency that they tried? To oh, my God. Not the petrodollar. Sorry, just the petro. The petro. Yeah, yeah which he didn't explain how it was going to be tied together, but there's some kind of connection there. <clears throat> and it's it's a continuation of the same problem. And things are getting terrible. The inflation is eating away at the standard of living. The Venezuelan minimum wage at this point is equivalent to about a dollar a month. That's how bad things have gotten. I am a little bit ignorant on the economics of this situation as a whole, but like, could we have seen this coming? And is there any way that they can really right this ship? Like, as an outsider, what could we do or what could we learn from this? Well, I think... Look, I think that in theory, yes, there's things that a country could do in order to to ride the ship. But the question is, um, are there things that the people in power want to do that would benefit the nation as a whole? Or is it more of this like dynamic of every they're just kind of looking out for themselves? And, you know, like, look, for example, one of the one of the problems that happened in Venezuela was that. Once Maduro and Chavez came into well, once Chavez came into power, they started nationalizing industry. So what they were doing is using oil in order to subsidize other industries. So Venezuela was selling so much oil that they started making their oil company literally subsidize the food production and things like that. So in 2014, when the price of oil fell, the economy was so dependent on oil that it kind of kick-started this process. But there's so many other internal dynamics. So, for example, one of the things that Maduro did was not only did they nationalize companies, meaning that they took private companies and essentially just took them from the management and said, this belongs to Venezuela now. But on top of that, the people that were put in charge of running them were all just family members and political allies <laughs> of these individuals. So now you have literally the country's economic machinery uh, is being stunted by nepotism. So you have all of these multifaceted things. So I would say, yes, I'm sure that if you got 20 economists and historians in a room and you're like, hey, how could we get out of this mess? Could they come up with some solutions? The answer is probably yes. Would they be solutions that the people in power want to implement? My guess is the answer is no. <laughs> Man, I've been yawning a lot this morning. One of the things I'll say is that some of the cryptocurrencies like Dash have been really trying to make a push in Venezuela. They're, this is like the case study. They're really hoping that they can get adoption sooner than later in Venezuela and kind of save these people from like, how is crypto the solid asset? Like, that's great. Like, the volatility of crypto is nothing, nothing compared to what they're dealing with, which is nuts. Yeah. 
No, it's 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 historic, <laughs> you know. And honestly, Mike, to answer your question, my guess also is that it's not going to change. Things are going to get worse before they get better. And um, if unfortunately, if I had to predict what's going to end up happening in Venezuela, it's either going to be a <coughs> violent revolution or foreign intervention. I, I, you know, like, do I really see you know a scenario that like to get involved in uh, other countries' problems? <laughs> Right. So obviously the answer there is yes, the United States loves to get involved, but I don't think it's as easy today for them to do it. And this is going to be a very unpopular statement, but I'm going to say it. Um, at least for the last 20 years or 15 years, one of the main tools for U.S. intervention has been Islamophobia, which doesn't apply to Venezuela. So when you throw out a Middle Eastern country, unfortunately, most Americans are like, oh, yeah, I guess it's all right for us to invade. Is it a Pakistan? Is it Iran? Is it Iraq? Is it, you know, whatever. So but with a South American country uh, and especially like no Islam or anything like that, I think it's going to be much harder to try to sell that intervention to the American public. Yeah, but if they say anything wrong, it's just fake news. That's a good point. Yeah, I don't know if so. you guys saw, there was a story that Donald Trump actually asked his cabinet why we couldn't invade Venezuela. That was like circulating probably a month and a half, two months ago. <laughs> like it was oh, a well, I mean, why can't we just Why can't we do it? Yeah. <laughs> just go get him. I mean, the funny thing is, like, that's a question I would ask, but I'm not president of the United States. <laughs> I feel like at some point along the way, maybe we should consider some foreign policy. Like, I don't understand. How do you even get to this point without, like, considering what's going on in the world? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah it, like, did he preface it with, all right, guys, I know this might sound a little bit ignorant. I'm not 100% sure. I'm not really well versed in this, but can't we just bomb them? <laughs> like, so crazy pitch why don't we just take it <laughs> I, I always pictured it as him going into the meeting with a notepad and he's like alright I have some countries here and you guys just let me know if I can invade or not uh, <laughs> it's Monaco. one of those Monaco where is that Mona oh that's Europe okay no never mind we won't invade that yeah <laughs> All right. Uh, any rants this week? Anything that's coming to mind? Anything that you guys are frustrated with? Anything grinding your gears? No, I mean, we, we're, we're, it's almost like we're starting to create that uh, the roundtable episode specifically for rants. If you didn't listen to our roundtable episode, we decided to talk about Twitter for like an hour. So the we've gotten lots of feedback in both directions about that about that episode. Uh, everything ranging from wow, you need to make that more structured, and like each person gets two minutes to yo, what the fuck, stick to crypto, what's wrong with you? Yeah, that sucked. And some people said it was awesome. I think they're gonna like the round table coming up with Rob much better, though. That was that was really, yeah, good. yeah, yeah. The one on Monday is gonna be really good. Uh, Rob Viglione came back, and we're talking about uh, we're talking about game theory on Monday with him. It ties into crypto a lot, has a lot of insane things to say that uh will absolutely go over some heads because uh, when as he was speaking i was just like whoa okay yep i this reminds me i know nothing <laughs> i was not involved in that recording i'm very disappointed i was on the road but i am very much looking forward to hearing that and just as a side note like how great is rob by the way oh he's awesome he's just he's like definitely. unbelievable contributor just like really supportive of us just been so awesome from the beginning we're very thankful to have him as an ally yeah, on the episode we told him he was officially an independent correspondent or something of that nature. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, told him, I told him that he could add crypto basic panelist to his uh, <laughs> resume. Twitter profile. Yeah, and yeah. if he ever needs to get into any crypto conferences, feel free to drop our name. Let him know. We'll we'll <laughs> confirm. We'll that he we'll does send them the audio him. files of yeah. of his qualifi uh, qualifications. Oh, Robert Viglion? Yeah, he's definitely one of our best panelists. A hundred percent. Let him in, please. Let him in. <laughs> Put it on my tab. <laughs> All right, Brent, time for the mailbag section. Yeah. Crip basic. Flags your Friday. You listen to the mailbag drop where we break down a member's thoughts. Just starting crypto, don't you stop. Where's my snare? Keep this until you hit the There's spot. There's no snare, guys. <laughs> yeah. Cashman. 
All right, so Cashman left us a great, What a great screening, by the way, to follow up a 50-cent mailbag drop. It's like, here's some 50. All right, or not, first questions coming in from Cashman, getting that cash money. Well, you were, you were giving me that where's my snare, which that came from Eminem. So I was trying to... I was trying to like use the because he goes like where's my stare and then he starts like adding a couple words. I was trying to put Cashman over the words and it was a miserable fail. So here we are. There's no snare in my drums. <laughs> Eight mile style. All right. So this question uh, it comes from Cashman. As I mentioned, there's two questions. First one, in a five year time frame, how much fiat would you need to invest today as a lump sum? To have it grow into a million, any project, any coin. Um, this one's a little tricky because I don't want to tell people a number like 200K and say, hey, if you invest this money, it's going to grow five times in five years because that's irresponsible and unrealistic and probably not going to happen. So while I would like to tell people that the number might be lower than that. I think you're not going to be all that thrilled with our answers. Brent, lead us off. How much money do you need to invest in a lump sum to have it grow to a million? The answer is, we have no idea how much. That number may be 1.5 million that you need to invest in order to have it grow to a million. Like We do believe that in five years, crypto will certainly be higher than it is now. And in 10 years, it's even more likely. But... All right. Is so, it going to outpace 10% per year? Probably, possibly. I don't know. All right, There's no real way to know this. It's the Twilight Zone. Mike and Brent are giving <clears throat> responsible answers, and Kareem is actually going to have fun and give you uh, uh, an irresponsible <clears throat> answer. So I took that. I took this question to mean like a min-max scenario, like realistically. Obviously, Cashman, you know that the three of us don't know anything individually. Combined, we know even less. So this is, you know, this is just basically us guessing. However, um, we were we're in conversations with another podcast. They're called Crypto Voices. Again, I want to give a shout out to Lummy Flux for putting us in contact with them. But since they are going to collaborate with us, I went to their website and they have these awesome charts, like very cool work that they put into it. And one of the charts that they have is a compound annual interest return for all the different coins like Ethereum and Bitcoin. And what you see with Bitcoin is that more or less at some of its peaks, we were looking at like 400 percent um, annual returns. And it's been more or less declining with a couple of years, 300, 200 percent. And of course, if you bought in January, we've actually gotten into the negative because it, it's been dipping. But if if you look at the trend of that chart and assume that it keeps going down, like the stock market normally grows, like Brent said, more or less at like 10 percent. That's a general thumb that rule of thumb that we can say this investment is growing at 10%, right? Crypt, uh, things like Bitcoin have been coming down from 400% to 300%, 200%. So let's say that over the next five years, if you get an average return, a uh, compound interest return of 60%, which is insanely high, 60%, you would need a minimum of $100,000 lump sum today. And if that number goes down to 30%, which means it's outpacing regular stocks by threefold, so that's still a very high number. If you have a 30% compounded return, you're still going to need about $250,000 lump sum interest. So to answer your question, yes, there's a really good chance that crypto is going to blow up, and I still think it's a good investment. However, if you want to have a million dollars in five years, you're going to need to have a lot of money already. <laughs> yep. That is very true. The answer is not buy $100 worth of Tron. We know that. <laughs> so, Kareem, if you're picking the coin, you you would just basically pick Bitcoin for that? Uh, I would either pick Bitcoin or Cardano or Ethereum. Uh, okay. Mike, what would you pick? Hand on my heart, if I have to pick a single thing for five full years, I think I like Cardano. And... Yeah, if, if it were three years, I wouldn't take Cardano, but five is a long time. And I do believe that Cardano will eventually just have a really, 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 really good product. Yeah, I can agree with that. I would probably grab Cardano too. I'm definitely yeah. the most bullish on Bitcoin. You guys know Cardano is my favorite project, but I think I'm the most bullish on Bitcoin out of the group. Like, I definitely yes. see, like, I don't think Bitcoin's going anywhere. And I think it'll be number one next year and the year after that. I think. I think just 
from a game theory perspective, total market cap of Cardano versus total market cap of Bitcoin over a five year stretch, I think Cardano is going to do just fine head to head. That's not just like, yeah. Okay. Not, so I'm so one, one of your, one of your answer, I'm going to try to wrap my brain around. I guess the compounding interest doesn't really make this work the same way. So I'm trying to think how much big, I guess the Bitcoin itself would stay at a, at a consistent value. So you would, so basically for a million dollars, if you invested 200, 250 K, then you're expecting a four X, you know, rough return over five years. You know, what is Bitcoin floating around today? 7,000 or so. You know, is it going to be 28,000 in five years? Yeah, I could definitely see that being a very realistic scenario. Like, I mean, it could also breach 100,000 by then and have gone back down to 10,000 from being at 100,000. Who knows? Five years is a long time. Um, yeah. Yep. Five years is, uh, <clears throat> what, what was Bitcoin's price five years ago? Like 20 bucks? <laughs> so I don't know. No way to, no way to know. Invest what <clears throat> you can afford to lose. If you're talking about investing in crypto, just be very cautious. And His follow-up question. I'm oh, sorry. I thought you were done. Oh, there's a follow-up. Well, there's two questions. That was part one. Oh, all right. Oh, yeah. Part two, that. better odds, crypto or playing the lottery? Finish reading. Oh, well, nope. That's not. He wrote more than that. Hashtag T-E-A-M-K-A-R-I-M. And it's got a red squiggly line underneath it. I'm not sure what that's all about. Hashtag Team Kareem. All right, continue. Oh, so he's basically comparing Kareem's like picks in his portfolio to, to his lottery. random as playing the lottery. Okay, that makes sense. Right, okay, yeah, sure. so, the, so the better odds crypto are playing the lottery is not... The lottery is like one of the worst things you can do. So you you're better off playing blackjack than playing lottery. So like, you know, you're the the, the vig on lottery is massive, massive. Don't play the lottery like unless you really want to help education or something. I don't know. <clears throat> you know what? I'm going to add this to the rant section and I'm going to go ahead and say, fuck the lottery. Don't play the lottery. Don't and don't buy scratch offs. Don't buy Mega Millions tickets. Don't buy it all. Don't buy anything. Who cares? Why would you do that? There's, It's not fun. It's just torching your money. And it's preying on the fact that you're going to compulsively buy things while you're doing something else at the gas station. Just don't do it. Stop. Yep. Nope. You shouldn't. Uh, the, the the VIG on most lotteries is like 33%. VIG being the the house edge. Like if, if you buy a $1 lottery ticket, your expected return is approximately 70 cents. Yeah. So just to be clear, the this question is equivalent to asking, do you prefer pizza or getting punched in the face by Mike Tyson? So that's more or less the comparison here. It's pretty yeah. clear. Yeah. Go with crypto. Don't get punched in the face by Mike Tyson. He punches really hard. Yeah. Uh, and and just yeah. yeah screw, screw lotteries. They are way like a, like your expected loss on a dollar in black. If you're playing blackjack in a casino, which, you know, you're going to lose. Eventually, people have gambling problems. They lose all their money playing games like that in casinos. Every dollar you wager, your approximately return on that dollar is ninety nine cents. So that's like that's how perfect. big of a difference. Yeah, it, yeah. If you're of course. terrible, the, it, you're still getting what though, Brent? Like eighty five cents on the dollar return? Yeah, 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 yeah even it, playing really bad blackjack, you can still you're not right. nearly as bad as the lottery. What's you're the lottery get, like? Sixty cents a dollar or something? Like it depends on the jurisdiction, but it's some it's around thirty to thirty five percent of uh of it goes oh, away cool. so yeah you know what actually yeah, you can since since mike added this to the rant section this is just a quick opportunity for people who don't understand maybe how not just how the lottery works people understand how the lottery works but also how casinos make money there's no cheating involved or anything like that it's just a simple process of giving you terrible terrible odds right if i take one dollar <throat> from 10 people and i'm like hey guys i'm gonna do a giveaway give me a dollar and you have a one in ten chance of the giveaway and the giveaway is five dollars. Every time I run the giveaway, I'm gonna make five dollars because I'm collecting ten dollars and I'm only giving away five. So every single person has a one in ten chance of winning, but when they win, they only get five times their money, which means that they should be getting ten times their money. So that's how lotteries work, that's how casino works. Nine. And they're inherently yeah, nine times their money. Thank you. It's inherently a negative expectation uh play. So what you should be doing is Definitely things that have positive expectation like assets, stocks, real estate, cryptocurrency. At least digital assets are assets. 
This is just the lottery is just a tax on the poor. <clears throat> And it might feel weird for us to rant against both the lottery and gambling, considering that we've that we've all been professional poker players. Uh, there, there is a slight difference between gambling and poker, which is, it sounds like you're almost like justifying something, right? But poker, you're not playing against the house. That there, poker is more akin to trading uh, stocks, almost like you you are making a trade. There's a winner and loser, and in the middle, somebody takes some money, which is the house and poker, but you're playing against people, not against odds. Like you cannot You're paying a transaction beat fee. craps, right? Well, you, you know, and and people will often say they'll be like, "Oh, I don't like to go to to the, you know the MGM Grand. They're th they rig their blackjack. Yeah, they present you a rigged game. Like every blackjack is rigged. You cannot beat it. And well, blackjack's a bad example because like in outlying situations you can beat it, but the uh, you can't beat craps. Like beat oh, they bag. load their dice. They don't have to load their dice. It's already loaded against you. Yeah. I believe that we've, I myself personally have said multiple times in this podcast that even though I consider poker a very good hobby for myself, I do try to cautious others that are interested in it because I don't want to glorify it because I know how difficult it is to succeed in a game where my edge isn't that big compared to my competition. And I have to step very carefully on every decision to hopefully maintain that edge the way that I, that I expect. What's interesting, yeah. though, is I would argue that our edge over a recreational player in poker is higher than the house's edge in a blackjack game over a customer. Oh, yeah. If you are not good at poker, you are way worse playing poker than probably even playing the lottery. Like your expected loss at poker, if you are not particularly educated at that, is way worse than yeah, it is. Yeah, it's probably close to the lottery, at least. Yeah, it, it starts getting to the huge <clears throat> loss on investment. All right. We got one more question, right? Yeah, yeah, we got one more question here. This is from the uh, the Crypto Knight. The question is, do you think there is a use case or a way for blockchain or smart contracts that could solve secure vote election voting given all the insecurities of paperless systems? Kareem, you look excited to answer, buddy. What's going <laughs> on? I do look excited to answer because I'm looking at the screen right now. And I see three people that really don't know anything about anything. And I'm reminded of the fact that I asked this exact question to Robert Viglione in the episode that's coming out on Monday. And this is somebody who's working on a voting system, uses blockchain, and has an economic background with game theory studies. So therefore, my advice to Crypto Knight is don't you dare miss Monday's episode, boy, because Robert Viglione is going to answer that question. Uh, spoiler alert. It does look like it's possible. Yep, I was willing. I was going to say something similar. That was that's literally a uh, a teaser for Monday's episode. Oh, is that why you deleted? I linked an episode in the Discord that use cases one hundred and one. I linked it as a response to this because I felt like we had addressed it many times, and I think someone deleted my comment. Nope, nope, oh, not me. Super weird. Okay, no joke. <laughs> Because I didn't know that the Rob answered this question. So I, it seemed like a question we wouldn't answer on the flagship. So I responded with a link to our use cases 101. And I looked back at it later, like six hours later, and my link was deleted. So I figured one of you guys deleted it for yeah, I know, as flagship rule, preservation. I never <clears throat> answer the mailback questions, even though I, I have seen that both of you have forgotten that general rule. You guys need to stop I yelled at answering, myself for answering the mailback questions. They're for the show. <laughs> Yeah, I screwed. I answered this one right away, and then I was like, "Oh my god, I'm so stupid!" I Although, waited. if you're linking to crypto basic content, that's probably a, a fair exception. Sure. I mean, I thought I, my my personal rule for the mailbag has been: Do I think that we're going to answer this? If probably not, which I really didn't expect us to answer this, then I'll just I'll answer it on there or whatever. <laughs> Judgment call. Anything else we want to touch on before we wrap up this edition of the Friday Flagship? No, I just want to say we have the best listeners in the world. I want to thank Jesus for giving me this opportunity to talk to you guys. And I don't want to thank, um, I don't know, I just, it just felt like a winning game speech. Never mind. No, I have nothing else to say. I love you guys. I'd like to thank God, yeah. my coach, my Charles parents, Huskinson, my Metallic. sister, McAfee. So Kareem is Tebow like now. To thank, we would like to thank McAfee for giving us so much content. McAfee, this is for you. For you. I'm going to buy that crypto so I can talk to you. 
Oh, I forgot about that one <laughs> where he was going to make the McAfee. Crypto. It's so awesome too, because like, imagine if you're a McAfee trying to create a scam coin and instead of creating a scam coin, you're just like, Oh, I'm just going to make people pay for my attention. And that's the only use case of this entire thing. Like what kind of narcissist does, does he have to be to like go to those lengths? It's insane. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You can tell a lot about somebody's mind frame by, uh, when they do stuff like that. <laughs> All right, for the Crypto Basic Podcast, my name was Mike. I was here with Brent and Kareem. Thanks again for tuning in. The members of the Crypto Basic Podcast are not financial advisors. They are idiots. Please don't take anything they have to say as financial advice. Do your own research. Rate us on iTunes. And keep listening.